This is why growth modulation is good. It's not a perfect example, but in this child with diastrophic dysplasia, the child had severe equino cave of varus deformities with multiple operations, stiff feet. So the doctor here tried to get the feet flat on the ground by doing an osteotomy in the distal tibia. Well, of course, he's a long way from the cora, but look at the angular deformity in the translation he had to achieve to get the feet flat on the ground. So imagine if you could do that with an eight plate laterally way down here. So, so we, um, we are using more and more eight plates um, to manage these deformities. I did not do that osteotomy, by the way. Growth modulation has been used in skeletal dysplasia for some time. Um, there have been multiple people who have been looking at it, but the eight plate has been a big, uh, a big improvement. Um, and I guess 2007 was the original article, was it? Yeah. Growth modulation in skeletal dysplasia depends on all these factors. So the inherent physial growth abnormalities are something that are pretty obvious. Um, uh, limited final height, um, slower growth, the magnitude of these deformities is often quite significant. Um, there's usually an associated sagittal and rotational deformity. Um, there's usually a very early onset of these deformities, and they're often progressive early on in life. And so sometimes you have to consider treatment as early as two, three, or four years of age. And that means you're going to have repeated procedures through life. Um, and very, very important, it's hard to predict which ones will get worse because the phenotypes vary tremendously with the same genotype. So here's an example in achondroplasia. So, so the mean height of an adult acon is 30 centimeters less than a, um, an average stature male. Significant difference in growth potential. And this child with primordial dysplasia, MOPD2, there's his growth chart. So do you think that if I put an eight plate in here, you're going to get any correction? No. So you have to think about that. So the rate of growth does have an impact on correction, right? And you have to be thinking about that when you use these tools. So all the, 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 the standard ways of predicting growth um, are, are not very effective in skeletal dysplasia. And so one of the issues is when you're trying to use the hand and wrist for a bone age to see how much growth you have remaining, it's very hard because in achondroplasia it varies, and in other dysplasias there are no um, uh, skeletal age um, manuals available. So here's an example of growth in achondroplasia. Seven years old to 14 years of age, a young lady, she had nine centimeters of growth during those seven years compared to 23 centimeters in the average stature girl. So one of the nice things about the eight plates is its modular um, construction and the fact that you, you don't have to use just the screws in the set. You can use longer cannulated screws. And so here's an example of a child with pseudoachondroplasia and you can see these small, tiny epiphyses can be, um, can be accessed with longer um, screws with this system. But there are problems with some of these children. So here's an example in pseudoachondroplasia where there was no improvement over several years. And that was because there wasn't much growth and the child's BMI was very high, and there was lateral collateral joint laxity, and eventually um, I just abandoned it and did osteotomies. So growth modulation in achondroplasia is very effective in the first decade, um, but as you get into the teenage years, it's not as powerful for the reasons that you've just seen. So here's a child, achondroplasia, four years of age, significant deformity with internal tibial torsion, small epiphyses, a long fibula, and lateral joint laxity. So can I do growth modulation on this child? I could try. Might be effective. Um, but up until this stage in my career, I haven't usually attempted it at that age. 
Here's an example of a boy I took care of between age two and three, progressive deformities and um, uh, symptomatic. And so I did simple oblique osteotomies, corrected the angulation and, um, and uh, rotation, and um, had a reasonable result. Here he is at uh, five, uh, two years um, post-op, but he had some recurrence in his early teenage years. And so I went to growth modulation as I did this very recently, and you can see him starting to correct there. So I think that um, uh, it's very effective and I, I have to start changing the way I use this tool. Um, so here's an example of an 11 year old boy where he had significant distal tibial varus but not much upper tibial varus. So I used a combination of techniques, growth modulation to improve the varus proximally and realignment osteotomies distally. Uh, example in metaphyseal dysplasia, it's a very powerful tool in these kids, and you'll see some examples from Dr. Stevens in a second, but you can see there's excellent realignment opportunity in these children. Um, this is um, uh, from um, Dr. Stevens and Dr. Nevez, Dr. Nevez's article, and the important thing here is look at these up here. So they were using the eight plate to try and achieve some improvement in the hip development. And you'll hear a little bit more about this um, um, use later. So here's an example of um, a child with multiple epiphyseal dysplasia. And you can see the dramatic improvement. This works extremely well with valgus deformities, probably better with valgus than with varus. And um, uh, you can see also the effect at the ankle. Morchial syndrome. Very effective, but with Morchio syndrome, you've got to do it early. You really want to aim to get them corrected before 10 years of age. After 10, there's very little growth potential remaining. But you can see I did get some correction. Um, at the ankle, I use a, um, a screw um, um, uh, uh, method of growth modulation. Um, uh, I, I think you can see how effective it is. Um, Dr. Stevens has some other thoughts on growth modulation at this level. We know that the tension band plate is as effective as the screw, but I, I found it more prominent. I presented this data um, at um, POSNA this year. We had 109 children with skeletal dysplasia we had used growth modulation in, and you can see the variable um, um, diagnoses. And we had a successful correction for the first time at around 86%. Successful correction at final follow-up was around 72. Um, and the outcome was very good. Um, the rate of change was similar to that seen in average stature, which I found kind of interesting. And at around a degree a month in the distal femur and um, 0.6 in the upper tibia. Metabolic bone disease. I'm going to give an overview of rickets. You know, there are multiple etiologic pathways. The main problem is usually phosphorus losing and calcium loss. So the most common diagnoses are nutritional rickets and vitamin D resistant rickets, usually the X-linked form. The unusual etiologies are the oncogenic and related to other disorders such as fibrous dysplasia and neurofibromatosis. The end result is renal osteodystrophy, which is rickets and the other things which you've probably all seen. Treatment, the one thing you have to consider is making sure that you have, you have control of the metabolic abnormality in these children. You won't do it yourself, a nephrologist or endocrinologist will do it, but get the child to them for evaluation before you operate on them. The deformities are usually long, bowing deformities. Um, uh, the femur is very typically a long C, and often there is distal femoral valgus, compensatory valgus. Uh, tibial deformity depends on the physiological stage at the time of the onset of the disorder. So if you have nutritional rickets starting in a child just before they start to walk, usually they'll go into varus. If you have a problem later on, once they've physiologically straightened out and are going into valgus, they'll get worse valgus. Um, remember, nutritional rickets can improve dramatically. 
Um, this was an adoptee from uh, Russia, and you can see the change over a couple of years with a, just appropriate vitamin D. How do you manage these deformities? Growth modulation or osteotomy. Problem with osteotomy in these young children is recurrence rate is very significant. So here's the child, a four-year-old boy, progressive genuvarum. He has uh, X-linked um, hypophosphatemic rickets. His pre-op labs were satisfactory. And varus, internal tibial torsion. And you can see the result with an eight plate over two years, very good result. I removed the eight plates, um, but he still had residual internal tibial torsion. And, um, and so we don't do this very often, but in this child I did bilateral distal tibial derotational osteotomies, and you can see the x-rays there. So um, growth modulation is very effective in this population, and um, uh, just um, keep in mind the, um, the potential for growth. You don't, want to be, you don't want to be doing these children later in life. Thank you very much.